The 8 million system nanotechnology, AMIS, obviously can't be understood in full detail because it's science fiction, but we're told enough that we can understand a little bit, and I find some of the details are important to understanding the story. Similar to medical knowledge, we seem to learn the most when something stops working. Environmental AMIS has serious problems and gets a lot of discussion in the later part of the story. I want to focus on Chapter 21, The Dignity of Returning to Dust. Here, an engineer explains to some powerful figure what's going on to the best of their limited understanding. This explanation contradicts what various other characters say about Amos getting overloaded or needing an update or things like that. However, most of these people have no idea what they're talking about. Meanwhile, the engineer does know, and I don't see why they would lie. Plus, I just think this serves as an info dump. So, I trust it. The way I would describe the engineer's description is that Amos development has layers. There are local Amos industries to which this engineer belongs. They make minor adjustments to Amos in specific regions. Their job is already quite difficult, and sometimes adjustments have unexpected effects, despite the best of efforts. Then there is a higher level layer, which I call the Core Amos Labs. These are even more secret, and are where Amos is created in the first place. It's expected that these people can debug the malfunctioning environmental Amos, but it's not known who or where they are. Much earlier, in Chapter 6, An Identity Confusion Violation, Tojiro says all Amos development is overseen by the IPMA. It's not clear what this means, whether it's talking about the local industry or the core labs. I do think it means both. In particular, I believe the IPMA is intentionally withholding the aid of the core Amos labs until all the factions agree to a truce. It's essentially holding the entire ecosystem hostage. This is how it's able to force a second truce, despite all the credibility it lost in the Peace Conference explosion incident. By the way, this is just some speculation, but it sounds like Amos was first invented before World War III, but was only used after. What's up with that? Maybe World War III was actually fought over who would get to control this new technology. In the nuclear winter that followed World War III, Amos was first released without any kind of permission. As punishment for that, its creators were put under international management. So here's an idea. Maybe some nation, or a group of nations, first angled to become the center of international management, and then caused the nuclear winter and the events that followed. In other words, their way to come out on top of a brutal war for control of nanotechnology was not to have exclusive control over it, but to have the most influence over it. They used nuclear weapons, gambling that it would force the Yao Yoruzu Corporation to release the Amos. They would then need to be punished, but the punishment puts most of the power into the hands of whoever controls the international management arrangement. Maybe this was the precursor to the IPMA. Although everyone gets to use the Amos, the ability to withhold core lab support to force a truce demonstrates the advantage that the IPMA gave itself. To clarify, this is a lot like saying Kinzo intentionally orchestrated the circumstances that gave him his giant pile of gold. We'll never know for sure, but it would be cynical to say that he must have planned it all out just because it turned out in his favor. That same sort of cynical reasoning is what I'm using for this World War III idea, so treat it with whatever skepticism you deem appropriate. To return from the digression, why does environmental Amos fail toward the end of the story? The engineers say the anti-earthquake Amos in particular seems perfectly healthy, always responding as expected, only it's not clear what it's responding to. Here's my phrasing of the engineer's explanation. Amos is made of tiny robots, but the robots need to be programmed. They don't act on their own, they need to be given instructions. The thing giving instructions is an Amos transmitter. There are many different kinds of Amos, many different robots, and each one has its own type of transmitter. That makes sense. Where it gets complicated is that each robot hears not only the instructions intended for it, but also the instructions intended for all other kinds of robots. These occasionally have some unintended effect, which is why managing Amos is so hard. Furthermore, since control of the transmitters is highly localized, the fact that Amos is misbehaving all over the planet is quite mysterious. It's tied back to that modern earthquake, which hits the entire planet all at once. But, as I said, the people making that connection don't know what they're talking about. Let's talk about modern earthquakes. They hit multiple random spots on the planet, simultaneously. They have nothing to do with plate tectonics, and started happening only in the A3 dub era. I suspect they're somehow related to Amos. For example, maybe they're somehow involved in powering Amos. That's just speculation though. The bigger point is about how the earthquakes hit random spots on the planet. I think that actually, all modern earthquakes hit the entire planet. However, most of the earthquake is completely neutralized by anti-earthquake Amos, which is deployed everywhere. In fact, no one should ever feel any of these earthquakes. However, as explained, local Amos is always having little adjustments made to it, and sometimes these adjustments have unintended consequences. Sometimes a seemingly unrelated adjustment will disrupt the local anti-earthquake Amos. Then, when the next modern earthquake comes around, that part of the world will actually feel it, and then the local industry will make further adjustments to patch that up. The location of modern earthquakes is used for a lottery, so where they hit is supposed to be unpredictable. 
Well, in the first place, not many people seem to understand this business about the different types of transmitters accidentally messing with the wrong kinds of Amos. Furthermore, these interactions are so complicated that the local experts can't fully predict them, so practically, it really is basically random. It's implied that the one entity which may be able to comprehend the system well enough to predict it is the core Amos lab. So, if those people are ever short on resources, presumably they can use this lottery to get more funds. But in Chapter 20, Disaster Utopia, a modern earthquake hits the entire planet. I think what's happening there is that the Amos has been adjusted in all locales at the same time. This adjustment happens to mess with anti-earthquake Amos too, so the earthquake hits everywhere. Or it might not be accidental, maybe the anti-earthquake Amos was intentionally told to do nothing, similar to how various environmental Amos also seems to be told to do nothing. But either way, this looks like simultaneous global control of Amos transmitters. How is that possible? One answer is, it sort of isn't, using known technology. But maybe there's secret unknown technology, wisdom, which can actually control Amos all across the entire planet at once. I believe such wisdom would be held by the Order of Prometheus, who I closely identify with Leto and the IPMA. In other words, Leto created this environment problem and then refused to let it be solved by constraining the core Amos labs. This way it forces all the factions into a truce. I definitely think the whole incident is Leto's doing. I think it may have used wisdom for this, but I think there are other possibilities too. Furthermore, the kid's meal isn't complete. There's also supposed to be water problems which come later, as well as that medical biohazard event. How do you explain all that? Share your thoughts. My own explanations will be in other videos.